Hello, my name is Eric Holscher, and I'm one of the co-founders of Read the Docs. And I'm here to talk to you today about bootstrapping a sustainable open source project. So this is going to cover kind of the story of Read the Docs and how we became sustainable. Um, yeah, and so my, my goals here today are hopefully you'll kind of get a little bit more understanding of kind of the state of open source infrastructure and uh, how things are made sustainable. Uh, and then hopefully there'll be some uh, some tips and tricks or, or at least some kind of uh, relatable stuff in here that you can kind of apply to your, you know, your open source project or kind of, you know, the work that you're doing around trying to make uh, things sustainable. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and I'm going to do a little bit more of a, you know, introduction uh, on the slides here. Uh, the other kind of hats that I wear, not super relevant to this talk, um, but are useful to, to understand kind of who I am is I'm one of the co-founders of Write the Docs, which is a global community who cares about software document of people who care about software documentation. Uh, and so, yeah, we have conferences in Portland, Prague, and Australia, uh, plus India. And um, we have an online uh, big Slack with you know thousands of members and a newsletter. And uh, yeah, it's just lots of folks who care about docs. And then I also wear kind of the Python hat as well. So that's kind of the the background that I'm coming from in terms of my perspective and and you know the work that we're doing. And so, yeah, I'm involved with the Python Software Foundation in a, a couple different ways uh, over time. So did want to kind of note that this talk touches on burnout and uh, long stretches of unpaid work. I wish this was less familiar <laughs> for folks in the audience, but I'm, I'm guessing there's some folks who might still be going through this. Uh, and I just want to note that it, it does touch on that. And, you know, it took me a long time to be able to, to process and, and kind of talk about this and it was, yeah, it was really rough. Uh, so I just wanted to, to kind of note that for folks who might be kind of currently in that state and, um, you know, maybe not wanting to hear more about it. So it does have a happy ending, I should, <laughs> I should note. So, um, so yeah, with, with that um, in mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the Read the Docs origin story. I want to talk about, you know, kind of what the project is and, you know, kind of how it came about, just so you have a little more context. Uh, so it was actually created a little more than 10 years ago in the 2010 Django Dash, which is basically a 48 hour coding competition uh, in Lawrence, Kansas is where we actually created it. Um, it was three people, myself, uh, Charles Leifer and Bobby Grace were the team. And because it was 48 hours, we really wanted, you know, kind of a, a well scoped problem that we could figure out. And, and this is really kind of the, the problem we, we were solving, right, is dock hosting isn't great. You basically all the all the solutions out there were ways to kind of take some generated HTML files, put them in a zip, and put them on the internet somehow in a very kind of static, manual process. And so our kind of core insight here is basically that documentation should work like continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, documentation should be built on every commit, and then it should also be automatically deployed. And so that's really kind of what we built in that 48 hour uh, hackathon. Um, and the other big problem that we had was like a lot of projects, we'd be on a you know 1.2 and the project had moved on to 2.0 or whatever, and you couldn't get that old version of the docs. And so that was one of our other big goals was figuring out how to kind of make sure, you know, you could have all the, the versions of a, of a piece of documentation online uh, for all the users. And so we did have a, you know, a kind of a working site in 48 hours. It basically is just, you know, you push to GitHub, uh, it sends us a pull, uh, or sorry, a webhook. And uh, yeah, we pull down your repo updates and build the docs and then push them up. And so that was, that's kind of still the, the kind of the core of the product, right? Is that kind of workflow of, you know, you just write, you know, docs in Git or, you know, whatever version control you're using. And then we're all downstream of that, just making your documentation updated and beautiful. And so all the code is open source on GitHub. Uh, that was part of the kind of process for the Django Dash, but it's also something we believe in as a team. Uh, you know, basically you can take our, our whole code base and run it. There's a, a few little bits and pieces with like around operations work and stuff that's closed source uh, just because of security and, you know, ease of use <laughs> reasons. Um, but, but just about everything in, in the code is open source and you can add features to or, or whatever else. So fast forward to today, that was kind of the, the humble origins. <laughs> um, Currently, we have about 200,000 projects and 400,000 users, uh, but the number we really kind of keep track of is this page views number. So we had 580 million page views in the last year. Uh, that really shows kind of the, the usage, right? That's a, it's a lot of open source docs. <laughs> uh, and then we have 20 plus contributors across all our projects, um, but of that, basically seven are paid uh, and working on it pretty close to full time, four or five days a week. And we're currently hiring one more. 
And then we actually, on our blog, we do have lots of other stats uh, that we've been publishing every year for, for the past seven or eight years, if you're, if you're curious to dive in a little more. So in terms of the product, kind of the newest stuff that we're excited about in the last couple of years is pull request building. Uh, so basically, yeah, all, all the kind of workflow that, that we did when you merged into a main or a master branch, um, we now support on pull requests. You get live previews, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've added search for, for code objects. So, you know, if you're documenting Python code or Rust code or whatever uh, in Sphinx, we'll automatically kind of index that into search and have that, you know, object level, uh, you know, indexing. And the other thing we're working on and really excited about is embedding content across doc pages and, and across the internet. So basically having all the content in your docs, being able to embed that in your application, being, embe being able to kind of embed that across pages, similar to like what GitHub or Wikipedia do with a, a link cover. Uh, we have a, a version of that we're working on. So yeah, that's some, some fun stuff that we're working on. Uh, using the site, it is hosted. So you just go online, you register for an account, you import your project built you know, which, with docs, either in Sphinx or make docs uh, format. And then you configure it with a YAML file. So very similar to a lot of CI uh, that you might be used to. And then because we are open source, uh, there are lots of ways to get involved. Uh, you know, we, we'd love folks to come in and write docs or write code or whatever, you know, whatever other contribution in open source you're, you're curious to make. So anyway, this, this talk is, is not as much about the product or, or the features that we have as much as about the, the story of, of how Read the Docs became, you know, Somewhere, somewhere with you know, soon to be eight full-time people working on it. That was kind of the rosy stats picture, right? It, it kind of started out as, as a personal project. Um, and then we just kind of grew over time, right? So by about 2014, we were doing you know, millions of page views a month and we decided to create a company. We were seeing a lot of growth, but we didn't have a lot of time dedicated to the project. I was kind of working on it uh, close to full-time, you know, and around, late 2013, early 2014, but couldn't really commit to it. And so we really trying to start the company to, to try and create a little bit more, uh, a little more focus. So my, my co-founder, Anthony Johnson joined at that stage. I'd been contributing for a couple of years, but so now we have kind of two full-time people, you know, trying to work on it. <laughs> and we did go through a little incubator and they were, you know, there's a lot of folks talking about VC. Um, I know this is kind of a contentious topic. We don't, you know, we're not, pro or, or con against VC, uh, but we just didn't think we needed it. Uh, we already had a lot of use. We already had a lot of users. Uh, and so, yeah, we didn't think we would need it. And we didn't want to have this kind of pressure to, to grow uh, on, on us, right? We wanted to kind of be able to build the business that we wanted uh, for our users and for ourselves and not have the, you know, un unaligned interests. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, there's lots of valid reasons to do both. Um, and similarly, you know, docs hosting maybe isn't the the most high growth uh, part of part of the tech industry, I guess, let's say. But yeah, so it, it's allowed us to kind of grow at a, a slow pace, but not uh, not become too overwhelmed. And so when we created the company, we had this kind of open source thing uh, at readthedocs.org. We decided to kind of split them apart into a commercial and a community site. Uh, the commercial site being, you know, paid private repos, right? So anything that's on GitHub or GitLab that's private, uh, not a open source. Uh, that's only supported on readthedocs.com. On the community site, it's all free and open source. So it, it doesn't cost any money. Uh, and then it only supports open source. We realized this mistake is probably you know, bad at the time. You know, WordPress and Travis and a couple other folks were doing something similar, but Travis kind of tried to, to re-merge it. And then anyway, there's a, a different story there. Uh, and anyway, yeah, so we've, we're gonna eventually merge them back together because it's very confusing for users and branding and all this kind of stuff. But so we're gonna we're gonna kind of talk about both of them because uh, they are a little bit different and they kind of have different um, different kind of sustainability stories, let's say. So the community site, as I said, is free for open source. So how does how does that all fit together? What's the story there? Kind of in the you know 2013 2014 range, we kind of saw this this pattern emerge. There was you know lots of users and not much revenue. <laughs> this should probably be pretty familiar to folks here. So this is actually our, our traffic graph. Uh, I you know, took this somewhat recently so you can see the, the growth continues, but really we're talking about kind of the middle of this graph here. The, the highlight there is you know, October of uh, 2015 and we're doing about 15 million page views a month. So at that point we had 2014, 2015, it was just, just the two of us. We'd started a company and we're trying to kind of like make it work, <laughs> right? But 
it, it was not working <laughs> uh, for various reasons. You know, the, the, the commercial kind of site was taking a lot longer to build. There was a lot of complexity. Um, and then just on the, the community site, right, we had 15 million page views. Uh, we had no revenue. We, we tried a bunch of different things. I mean, the, the revenue isn't zero, but it's, you know, close to zero. <laughs> and we really did. We tried all, you know, we were very much in the discourse about uh, open source sustainability and all this stuff, right? We did donations, we did corporate fundraising drives, support contracts, you know, the like fake pro version where you just give people an invoice and then they magically pay you $100 a month, you know, out of the kindness of their heart. And that's how you build a business. <laughs> You know, there's all these schemes. Uh, we did, you know, contracting on doc tooling and doc process. We did training. We did all sorts of things, right? And it, really, at the end of the day, it was all just a, a huge distraction. <laughs> uh, and, and most of it didn't work, right? Like donations were in the hundreds of dollars a month. Uh, you know, corporate donations, similarly, maybe we'd get a 500 or or $1,000 every now and then. Um, but yeah, we just like couldn't kind of cobble together real money. And, and we were really, this, this was frustrating, <laughs> right? Every time we would go to a conference, everyone would be like, oh, we love your stuff. It's so cool. Yeah, we're like using it at my company. And like, I'd be like, oh, cool. Like, have you like, you know, contributed back? And like, like, how's that working? And, and they're just like, oh, no, it just like does what it needs to do. And, you know, we, we you know, basically the, <laughs> how, how I interpreted that conversation was like, oh, yeah, we just like file support issues, but we never contribute anything back. <laughs> And that, that was a very jaded view, but that, that was really how I felt at the time, right? I'd been working on this thing. Millions of people are using it each month. It's bringing all this value, but we just couldn't, we couldn't figure out how to capture the value, right? It was open source. We just, we kind of couldn't figure it out, right? And we tried all the things and we're just like, everyone we talk to says it's great. We really think it's important work we're doing, but we just can't, can't make it work. And this was super hard. Um, I, there's a, a longer version of this story that I, I don't want to, you know, this isn't, this talk isn't how I burned out on open source. It's, it's the sustainability part, but I do want to note that there were years of unsustainability, uh, in, in the process. And so really we, we tried one last thing, which was maybe the obvious thing. Um, but we really didn't want to kind of do it. Right. So we had, we had a few goals basically being like building an actual business, uh, not not a donation, right? We didn't want people to be donating out of the kindness of their heart. We wanted to provide values for companies um, or provide value. Uh, so the budget doesn't get cut, right? Like this is now a real business expense for that company. It's not a, a charity that they're just, you know, doing out of because they're, they're nice. <laughs> um, and similarly, like with all of our previous attempts had been kind of going after engineering budget. Uh, and we had really struggled with that. And so we really wanted to find something that that kind of came out of a different part of the, the budget of a company, not their engineering org. And so I, I wrote this up in a, a blog post at the time. Uh, and, you know, might, it's probably not going to surprise anybody that advertising kind of was the thing, right? It's it's a somewhat obvious and, and well-established business model for, for publishing, which is what we are in effectively, right? We, we are a publisher of open source documentation. But we looked at advertising and we're like, it's really awesome, right? The way that we think about it is advertising turns marketing budgets in, into community infrastructure, right? People want to get their, their names out and people running infrastructure are a great place. Uh, you know, as long as someone's interacting with it visually, <laughs> um, it's a great place to, to put advertising. And so it's, it's a really neat way to kind of pull in some of that marketing money into the open source ecosystem. But really we didn't, all the advertising out there, you know, the discourse around surveillance advertising, I mean, it wasn't called that at the time, but just the, the tracking and, and everything else. We just looked at all the ad industry and we're like, we don't want to, we don't want to be a part of this. <laughs> and so what we ended up doing is kind of creating our own thing. Um, we call it ethical ads. Uh, we have a, a, a brand that we're trying to build around it now, but basically it's that internet advertising as we, we think it should be, right? Uh, we don't track you. So this means that there's no third-party JavaScript or images uh, from our advertisers or, or third-party networks. Um, the way that we kind of provide value and you know, don't just put random images on page is we do targeting by page content uh, and user location. So we know what country you're in uh, from your IP address and we're able to target based on the content of pages, right? So it's like, is this a, a Python database page or is this a you know JavaScript CLI page or whatever. And so we're able to offer that to, to advertisers uh, 
based on you know what what users are looking at, not who they are. And I just want to note this is basically how every brand that you know of was created, right? Nike, you know, they were they were running TV ads, not uh, you know not tracking you around the internet because because the internet didn't exist when Nike was created, <laughs> conveniently enough. But we we basically think about it as newspaper advertising on the internet, right? I don't need to know who picked up a newspaper. I just need to know you were reading the sports page to, to advertise you Nikes, right? And, and this works perfectly well. And we've, we found it very effective and we're, we're making you know, real money for folks with it. And the other really nice thing about advertising is that the revenue grows with usage. So as we get more users, uh, we're able to generate more revenue. And so that it scales kind of very nicely. There's still a lot of work on the business side to, to make those things scale, but, um, but it actually, the, the model itself works well in that way. And so really the way that we think about advertising in terms of the, the business is it's a micro payment that scales. You know, if we could charge every reader of documentation a penny, we would do that. But there's, there's no technology that, that works at scale for that and is proven. And so advertising is the way that, that we can make that work basically. And so we built this for Read the Docs and then we eventually kind of got closer to sustainability. We got you know, three, four, five people working on it. And so we started to wanna also help the projects that we're hosting become sustainable. So large projects that have their docs on Read the Docs, we were able to start doing a revenue share program with some of them, uh, like Celery and, and a few others uh, to also help them become more sustainable as well. So that's kind of, we started with that idea of kind of bringing more people in uh, to the advertising mix. Um, and then in just about a year ago, we actually launched Ethical Ads Network, uh, which is the basically the same advertising philosophy, uh, but as an, ad, as, as an ad network. So it's available to all open source uh, and developer focused projects. Uh, and so that's kind of one of the, one of the ways that we're working to build, build the kind of ad, ethical ad industry in you know, the, the open source ecosystem. And so just to give you a sense of scale in the last month, uh, we paid out around $25,000 uh, to publishers. So, you know, we're not talking about like huge, you know, millions of dollars, but over time we, we do think that it, it could easily get there. We just need to, to keep building it. So, so that's, that's kind of the story of, of our community site, right? The, the dip of kind of trying all the, the classic things and then uh, coming up to, uh, to advertising as, as the somewhat obvious answer, but but building advertising in the way that we, we want it to exist. Uh, the commercial site, uh, readthedocs.com, is just kind of pretty standard SaaS, right? We have paid plans, they have different features, uh, and something we rolled out in the last year or so is, is concurrency. So making it much more build like a, a CI, right? So we used to try and do user-based pricing, but this gets really complicated with, you know, if you wanna share it or you have some users and your organization that just wanna read it and not edit it. and Anyway, it was really confusing. And so we ended up basically moving to a CI type pricing model based on concurrency uh, and features, right? So if you're an enterprise and you wanna have you know, audit tracking or whatever, uh, that's something you, you pay more for. So very, very classic SaaS. Uh, we should probably charge more. Uh, we, we know our plans are a little bit low in the, you know, in the scheme of things, but it's very hard to balance against the perception of free on our community site. Um, and then there's also a, a large number of users who want it kind of behind the firewall but we've had a really hard time building that kind of like behind the firewall business uh, because it is free and open source. And it's, it's really not, not that hard, <clears throat> excuse me, not that hard to operate. Uh, and so people can, can kind of run it themselves. <laughs> uh, so that is kind of it. There's like a, a hard pricing pressure that we feel on kind of both sides there uh, that makes it a lot trickier. Um, and our revenue does grow slowly, uh, especially with bootstrapping. Um, that's just one of the things, you know, it, it kind of looks, I, this is a Bezos graph, sorry for that. I don't, we don't share our, our kind of commercial revenue numbers um, publicly, but uh, you can see here it's, it's going up, <laughs> but it looks a lot like our page view data, right? It's, it's more of a, a linear growth uh, than, a, uh, than a, you know, a, a hockey stick growth. <laughs> and so, you know, who knows, you know, if we are VC funded, if we could get hockey stick, you know, invest more in marketing, advertising, all that kind of stuff. But we're, we're happy to, to kind of just grow slowly and grow our team at a, at a slow pace. And, you know, we just honestly, we feel lucky to, to have six or seven or eight people uh, working on an open source infrastructure project. And so we're finally at a point where both, both sides of the business can kind of support a few full-time people, uh, which is super exciting. 
So this is, you know, the, the commercial side is, is kind of a classic like hosted open source uh, as a solution, right? Um, but if your, your goal is just to build an open source project and sustain the community, it is somewhat a distraction. Um, but we, we actually don't view it as a distraction as much as a, a virtue. Um, you know, we, we really appreciate the perspective of our commercial users. Uh, they tend to have a, a slightly different audience, but it's allowed us to, um, to kind of expand who we can support on our open source project by kind of having that, that secondary viewpoint uh, on our commercial side. Uh, so in, in some ways it's a distraction, but at the end of the day, we really actually value having, having both of those audiences and, and supporting companies uh, with documentation as well as open source, right? If you, if you reframe it from, we care about open source documentation to we care about documentation in the software industry, helping people at work as well as in, in open source uh, is, are both you know, really valuable parts of the mission. And so we've been able to kind of grow our mission rather than, than view it as a distraction. Um, and currently our, our revenue is kind of split 50-50 uh, uh, between you know, the ads on the community side and paid hosting on commercial uh, and both are growing. So we're trying to, to kind of have them grow kind of in, in lockstep and yeah, it feels really good to have that two sources of revenue. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, advertising revenue basically plummeted but our, our SaaS kind of commercial side was, was pretty stable and grew, even grew a little bit. Uh, and so that was nice where we had kind of those, you know, two, multiple sources of revenue, uh, which, which gave us a little bit more stability. So one of the other things I wanted to note before the end of the talk is we're also exploring grant funding. Uh, we got a $200,000 grant from Chan Zuckerberg uh, to have two folks uh, join our team and work on kind of documentation and science. And we're actually applying for another CZI grant, which we'll hear back on in the next couple months. Um, and so this is a really, really cool way that a lot of scientific computing, at least, can be funded in the scientific ecosystem around Python. You know, we're talking about millions of dollars going to some projects and then, you know, focusing that on making science better. And if, if there's ever been a year uh, to make science better, <laughs> I, I think this is the one. And so I'm, I'm also one of the co-chairs of the, the uh, PSF's project funding working group, where we're kind of working to kind of build resources and community knowledge. And we're trying to collect some example grant proposals. And uh, yeah, so just like a lot of different resources and ways that you can kind of fund your project uh, to help the, the community within Python, but also the, the larger open source community uh, figure out how to, uh, you know, get, get paid for, for doing all the, the super important work that we're all doing together. Whew. So thank you so much um, for, for listening to my talk. And um, this was a very kind of abridged version of our sustainability story, uh, but I hope it kind of gave you at least a little bit of, of context for, for kind of how we came uh, to advertising on our community side. And then also the, you know, the kind of transformation of, of our commercial side into something that was a little bit of a distraction into something that we're able to kind of get a lot of value from and, and kind of you know, have have multiple important use cases where the, the kind of influence the design of a of the product and, and the project uh, that we're building. And so, yeah, I'd love love to answer any, any questions that folks have. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Um, but yeah, I'll be I'll be around uh, to answer answer some of your questions. And you can always reach out to me. Uh, the slides actually have my Twitter handle. Uh, you can also find me on email. Uh, or you know, just Google my name uh, or read the docs or whatever. You can you can find me pretty easily uh, through my association with those projects. And again, thank you, uh, thank you for coming to the conference. And yeah, it was great great to have the opportunity to uh, to share some of our our story with you. So have a good rest of your day. Thanks.